Hey guys, it's your girl Sage. I hope you're having a wonderful day or night whenever this video finds you. I'm here with the daily reading and for today we have Ezekiel chapter 37, The Valley of Dry Bones. The hand, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. One nation under one king. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph, that is, to Ephraim, um, and all the, all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they become one in your hand. When your people ask you, why won't you tell us, or when your people ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of jo Joseph, which is Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on them and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images and with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all of their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. Uh, they will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and they will have all. Um, they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They will. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever, and my Dave and David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. Oh, so that is a really great chapter, and it actually very much reminds me of um of a chapter 34 in the book of Ezekiel as well. But in this time... He's not, um, he's not convicting anyone. He's not convicting the shepherds from, you know, chapter 34. In this case, this is actually more about a message of hope, but also God's awesome ability. I really like this part right here where, you know, God, he's talking to the prophet Ezekiel and saying, son of man, I need you, um, or will these bones live? And Ezekiel, instead of saying, no, Lord, of course not, that couldn't happen. He says, only you would know. 
because he already knows what the Lord can do. You know, um, I love that so much. I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know, because he knows that God is capable of all things. You know, he knows that anything that God speaks, no word returns to him void. He also knows the awesome abilities that God has done. Um, but also what I really wanted to talk about too was as he's reviving these bones, it got me thinking about the way in which the Lord, he, when he speaks, like in this kind of example, when he speaks and does something awesome and amazing like this, like literally resurrecting these dry bones. And when we say dry bones, something dead that's just been laying there for a long time, you know, got me thinking about the way in which the Lord, he does these amazing, awesome acts, but these amazing and awesome acts also carry a stronger, more impactful message with them. God can do all things but fail, but God has a very, and I say this with love, like a very dramatic way of showing people that he is present, that he is Lord. We see this over and over and over again. Um, but one example I really want to talk about here is um, all the way back in the book of Exodus, where, you know, um, I almost said Genesis, sorry. But in the book of Exodus, where he's causing all these plagues to happen to Egypt, and each time, you know, Moses goes back and says, if you let my people go, you know, this will all stop. Because um, it gets to the point where the Pharaoh is even, like, asking Moses, can you talk to God and, like, ask him to stop doing these things, right? But um, we also know that each one of those plagues that God sent towards Egypt was to not only devastate the people of the land, the Egyptians, for oppressing his people, the Israelites, you know, not only just to do that, but also to make a mockery of all of the false gods and deities that they created to show that they aren't real. They aren't, they don't have life in them. They were created by man or, you know, I mean, maybe the apple cripe might suggest something different, but what I'm saying here is that they weren't godly beings. Um, and I actually like to just refer to them as false gods, if you will. Um, again, because God proved himself in book of Exodus that he can absolutely do what he wants, but not only that, he completely mocked them, you know, before everybody and humiliated them. And I, I just love that example because again, not only was it getting the message across that God is all powerful, he had another meaning that was impactful, that was insulting to all of these false gods and to, um, to the Egyptians that worshiped them. So, you know, when God does an amazing thing, he does more than one thing at once. He, he, you know, that's, the, and that's something really cool about God. I'm just going to go off a tangent here. God is so cool to do that. You know, he, he does something, but he's doing everything at the same time. Um, I, I just want to give a quick moment of shout out because that is one of the coolest things about God. Because while we may not always understand the things that he is doing in our lives and sometimes, and I say that in a way where Sometimes we are left confused, hurt, you know, that's where, you know, Proverbs chapter three, verse five through six comes in. We not earn your own understanding, but trust in him and he will make your path straight. But, um, and I can't remember this scripture verse, but you know, his ways of thinking are higher than ours, you know? So that's why we have to trust in him. It's very similar to how a child who does not know any better has to trust in their parents who do know better, or at least that's what that's what we would want for a child. You know, unfortunately there's been situations where the parent didn't know better, or maybe the parent did know better and they still acted in a way, but we're not getting into that. Um, anyways, so I wanted to talk about that because, you know, he's, he's bringing up these dry brown bones. He's literally putting them back together and it gets to the point where, you know, these bodies are brought back together. He has them prophesied to breathe um, or to put air into them. God could have just put air directly into them. He didn't have to talk to Ezekiel and say prophesy now. But the thing is, he gave Ezekiel that command, first off, because he knew that Ezekiel would be obedient to him. And being obedient to the Lord is very important because, again, his ways of thinking are higher than ours. You know, God has everything that God asks of us and everything that God does. He has a bigger purpose to it that we ourselves cannot understand in that moment. Again, Ezekiel knows you sovereign Lord, you know, if these bones can have life, you know, you know, but also he's not questioning the Lord of, 
Why are you asking me to prophesy? He's just saying, okay, you ask me to prophesy, I'll do it. So he's prophesying to these bones, you know, they're coming back. He, he prophesies air into their lungs and air comes into their lungs and they stand up. But one thing that really caught my interest here was um, Ezekiel 37 verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, which, and of course, Ezekiel was obeying him and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Um, and then right after that, you know, verse 11, we see, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried and our hope is gone. We are cut off. So there's a lot to unpack with that one right there. But what I want to talk about really quick is, you know, these people, after they have breath brought back into them, after they've had their bones brought back together, tendons, flesh, organs, everything brought back, the breath put back in them, you know, they get up on their feet and they're standing. But nowhere does it say anything about them rejoicing, you know, praising the Lord, anything like that. And I say this because all they are at this moment is their flesh. That's all they are, you know, and I wanted to bring that up because, you know, when we actually think about life and I'm talking about life, you know, we have flesh, we have soul and we have spirit because right here in, um, I just want to make sure I got it right. Okay. 37 verse 14. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I have done it, declares the Lord. <clears throat> so that's very significant right there. Because he's even saying, I will put my spirit in you. Doesn't that remind you of an event that occurred in the New Testament, starting with a P? Pentecost, right? Um, That, that has me thinking about that. But again, these people, they were all resurrected, but the imagery I'm seeing as I'm reading this is they're resurrected and they're all just standing there like this. And it's, it's strange, right? But it, that imagery, it, it almost makes me think about just how malleable our flesh is, you know, and, and just saying that right now has me thinking about how, um, how that scripture that says, you know, we are nothing but pots of clay, but what kind of arrogance would we have in ourselves to complain to the, the clay maker? Hey, I don't think you did this right. You know, that, that kind of got me thinking about that and how, how, um, malleable our bodies are, how temporary our bodies are and how feeble our bodies are. And the real value comes from within. The real value is what God puts in us. Because right now, all of these resurrected bones, which as amazing as it is, they were dry bones just left in the valley that, that God resurrected. As amazing as that is, that's all they are. They're just these human dummies just standing there. And it's not until God puts his spirit into them that they, that they know that he is the Lord, that they, they exist. You know, they're, again, they're just, they're as good as mannequins just standing there. It's, so I, I just wanted to bring that up because I just thought that was really interesting that, that, you know, I, I found it very powerful that it really goes to show that, you know, our flesh, our flesh is weak. Our flesh is, you know, our flesh is hardly anything compared to the spirit that God puts in us. Um, and I just, that was an interesting revelation I got from this chapter because I've only read it maybe a couple of times, but you know, this is the first time I really stopped to think about they were just mannequins until God put a spirit into them. Because again, they, they didn't even realize what was going on. They didn't realize they'd just been resurrected from dry bones. But then again, the Lord puts a spirit into them and they, that is when they will know that he is the Lord. So anyways, um, continuing on to the next part, this is where he's talking about, you know, uh, and this is the symbolism to his acts too, because again, I, I already mentioned that God, when he does an amazing, awesome act, he's doing more than one thing at once. Like I said, it is the coolest thing, the way he does everything at the same time. And we can also trust that he does good for those who love him too. Even if we can't understand it, you know, even if we're being put in the fire, he's refining us like silver, you know, again, you know, that's why we just have to trust in him and lean not on our own understanding. 
But anyway, so now he's talking about the symbolism that's going with his act of resurrecting all of these people. You know, um, he's, he's going to find the Israelites out of the nations where they've been scattered, and he's going to bring them back together into a safe dwelling place that he gave to their ancestors, the descendants of Jacob, Israel. So he's talking about this because, again, it's very significant that he's using dry bones in the earlier half of this chapter because it's supposed to represent a situation that just seems completely dead and at loss, you know, um, so in a symbolic spiritual way of speaking. That, you know, the Israelites, they themselves, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is gone. We are cut off. So they themselves, they feel their situation is as 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 um, abundant as a pile of dry bones where those dry bones aren't going to do anything. But as Ezekiel says, sovereign Lord, you alone know if these bones can live, you alone know. So that right there has me thinking about um, the scripture where God, you know, um, where we, we learn about God, that anything that God builds, anything that God establishes, will be permanent and forever. You know, um, also let no man separate what God has joined together. Right. And I know that's more about marriage, but, but, um, it's still anything that God puts together, anything that God builds is permanent and forever and lasting. And the only thing that, and, and I say thing, you know, the, no man can destroy it. No wildebeest can destroy it. No policies can destroy it. Satan can't destroy it. Nothing. The only thing that can destroy whatever God puts together is God himself. But whatever God puts together, it cannot be destroyed. And on the flip side of things, we also know that whatever God destroys cannot be rebuilt again. Whatever God puts an end to, that's it. It's over. So, um, and, and, you know, all of that has me thinking about the, again, this whole chapter has me thinking about God's great and awesome ability. And again, it's a really cool chapter with the, with the imagery of all of these bones being put back together and these breathing mannequins are brought back. Cause again, you know, he says he's going to put his spirit into them. And, um, when I was reading this chapter, I didn't really get that imagery yet. So at this time, for me at least, I'm, I'm seeing them as just like standing mannequins. But anyways, um, breathing mannequins. But anyways, I, you know, I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, again, the situation seemed entirely hopeless, but God, he's able to create a, he's able to create a path in a desert. You know, he's able to put rivers in the middle of a desert. And we even see that's happening right now here in modern times. You know, anything that God creates cannot be destroyed. And anything that God destroys is permanently destroyed forever. And that's why Jesus in the New Testament tells us to, you know, don't be afraid of man who can only destroy the flesh. Because as we just read right here, God can easily bring that back if he wants to. Easily. He knows if these dry bones can live. He knows. And Ezekiel knows that he knows that too. Um, but more than that too, be afraid of the one who can destroy your flesh and your spirit, you're, you know, be afraid of the one that can destroy what's on the inside. Because again, this is all temporary, you know, whatever, temporary, you know, I'm, and I hate to tell you that and remind you that I feel like I do it in every video, but it, it's true, you know, and then right here, this is where I feel he's talking about, this is where I feel he is talking about the new earth that he's going to create because he talks about how he's going to he's going to bring back the Israelites back into the nation of Israel and have them live under one nation, under one king. The king that he appoints is King David. But here's the thing. We already know that David has already passed away. And now, after seeing the resurrection of all the bones, he can easily just bring back David. He could easily just resurrect his bones. He, but here's the thing. He's, he doesn't do that because we actually see that throughout the rest of the Bible that we never really see David again. But here's the thing. We have to trust what we can't see. You know, we have to trust. Um, and that's what walking with faith is about. But anyways, um, so he's talking about how he's going to have David, his shepherd, be king over them. 
and they're going to live in peace. They're going to live, you know, where their ancestors live. They're going to live in peace with their children, their children's children, and he's going to increase their numbers too. So we know that there's going to be more people joining this as well. And um, later on, he also mentions too that he's doing all this so that his people know that he is the Lord and that his sanctuary will be among them forever. You know, again, he's establishing this covenant of peace with them. And of course, in the New Testament, we see this new covenant being formed through the blood of Jesus. And so this is kind of foreshadowing into how he's going to form this new covenant with his people. Again, he's going to bring them back from all around the nations. So really powerful chapter. Um, and unfortunately, I almost feel like I'm forgetting something, but I also understand that this video has been going on for a minute, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. If you guys enjoy, feel free to like, subscribe, and until next time, I hope all of y'all take care. Bye-bye!